Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man that knows that somewhere between blue and green, you will find Pinkerton. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the captain. And you might find us in the garage. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week, we are very excited to be featuring Red Ale by the good, hardworking folks at Torched Brewing Company in Grand Bend, Ontario, Canada. This is an Irish Red Ale brewed by a phenomenal Canadian microbrewery, which makes so much sense after having about half of a glass of this stuff because the flavor profile is a little bit of both. A little Canada, a little Irish. ABV 5.4% garage grade 3 and a half bottle caps out of five. And let's give some thanks and praise to our friends that helped us fill up the old garage fridge this week. First up, a big shout out to Jessica in Clayton, North Carolina. And a big we like your jib to Kelly Gray in Columbus, Ohio. And last but certainly not least, we have a long distance cheers to Nicholas Usitalo in Gothenburg, Sweden. Everybody we just mentioned, they went to our website and they donated to this week's beer fund. And for that, we thank you. Yeah, B W E W R U N Beer Run. If you're not subscribed on Apple Podcast or on Patreon, what are you doing with your life? You got so many great off the record shows. Got a great one coming up this Sunday. I'm not going to tell you what it is. You're going to have to check it out for yourself. And you can do so at truecrimegarage.com. And Colonel, that's enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Owen Sound police are releasing photos of the suspects wanted in the vicious assault of a business owner last week. These are the photos of two of the men wanted in the attack and the vehicle that they were driving. Police say the men attacked Sharif Rahman while he was in the process of closing his restaurant, the Curry House, last Thursday night. He was settling up with the last remaining group of customers when they attacked him, allegedly pushing and striking him and his nephew. Now, there was a large turnout in Owen Sound last night in support of Rahman. About 800 people gathered through the downtown area for a vigil. Rahman's nephew suffered minor injuries, but Rahman himself suffered serious life-threatening head injuries and has not yet regained consciousness. He remains in a London, Ontario hospital. There is another event planned for tomorrow in Owen Sound in support of Rahman and his family. You heard it there. That is audio from CTV News, and you can find them at ctvnews.ca online. That was a report of an incredibly aggravating story out of Ontario, Canada, and the result of that senseless attack is quite heartbreaking. But before we get into the details of this week's true crime story, we need to introduce you all to a great man named Sharif Rahman. Born and raised in Bangladesh, Sharif Rahman moved to Canada about 10 years before the events that we will be discussing this week. And those events are unfortunately leading up to the events of this last summer. Sadly, Sharif Rahman was murdered in August of 2023. Now, this murder took place in a very public setting, which quickly led to a very public murder investigation. This attack resulting in Sharif's death took place on Canadian soil. And as far as I know, Captain, we might be the first American true crime podcast show to provide coverage of this ongoing investigation. Let's learn a little bit about Sherry. Now, prior to arriving in the small city of Owen Sound, Ontario, Sherry earned a master's degree in international development at the University of Glasgow in Scotland. Then in 2015, Sharif purchased the Curry House a business that would marry two of his great loves, delicious foods, and giving back to his community. 
Sharif Rahman was a beloved individual. He is described by family and friends as a gentle spirit. So from 2015 through last summer, Sharif is a local small business owner who somehow manages to find time to volunteer for food banks and homeless shelters. He was also successful at helping to raise funds with a goal to end hunger in his community and beyond. He was a board member of the Gray Bruce YMCA, and he and his family spent time supporting their neighborhood initiatives as well. So as one will figure, he is rather a busy dude. Because as said, he was doing this all while running a popular downtown restaurant, the Curry House. We know that he very much enjoyed his restaurant for many reasons. He loved providing wonderful food and jobs to local residents. But the greatest joy his restaurant afforded was a space for community members of all ethnicities to come together to enjoy food, conversation, and connection. Frequently characterized as a peaceful and kind individual, the beloved local business owner seemed an extremely unlikely victim of a violent attack that he would unfortunately suffer on a humid August night in 2023. And just a couple examples of what he was doing for the community. He would have special events and the profits of those events would go to feeding the homeless. He also would donate his time and by cooking meals for the homeless as well. And just to complete this picture of this tragic mystery, Sharif and his young wife, Shayla Nazrin, emigrated to Canada in 2013 with the dual goal of beginning a business and starting a family. The two relocated to Canada in 2013 and settled in the small city of Owen Sound, Ontario. The community seems to have everything the young couple was looking for. Diversity, friendly residents, business prospects, and opportunities to get involved in local charities, fundraising, and other community activities. In 2015, the dream was realized when the couple purchased the Curry House, a restaurant in downtown Owen Sound, Ontario. The second and no doubt far more important, was achieved when having a baby in 2017. The couple welcomed their daughter just six years before Sharif's untimely and tragic death. In March of 2022, Sharif Rahman did an interview with Century 21. This was an in-studio video interview, and anyone who has seen this, I think, will agree. What I see in this interview is Sharif is a relaxed, modest man who is the embodiment of a true immigrant success story. He's soft-spoken and friendly, but exuding a quiet confidence. Sharif Rahman's eyes sparkle when he discusses the dishes he lovingly prepares at the Curry House. It is clear that the restaurant specializing in Indian cuisine from parts of India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. This is his pride and joy. And Sharif is unhesitating when asked to name his most popular dish, chicken tikka masala. In response to a question about the spiciest dish on the menu, Sharif laughingly categorizes the vindulu as 10 out of 10 on the fiery scale. But he becomes truly animated when he describes why he delights in what he does for a living, how every day is different, and the deep connection that he feels to each of his customers and the community at large. A little more than a year after that interview, a brutal attack would heartlessly extinguish this shining light, this, the shining light of this community, the Owen Sound community. And patrons of the restaurant and neighbors would forever mourn the loss of a beloved business leader and friend. The vicious murder of Sharif Rahman is as of yet unsolved. And I say as of yet because I think that there is plenty of meat on the bone here and a way for the public to help. And the community is left to wonder who would callously take this gentle, inspirational soul and true leader from their midst. 
So after purchasing the restaurant, the Curry House in 2015, Captain, and putting down roots in their adopted community, Sharif soon became a beloved fixture of that neighborhood. Again, he enjoyed not just feeding everybody in the community, anybody that was willing to stop into his restaurant, but also providing jobs. And you and I both talked and touched upon some of his fundraising efforts and volunteering efforts. But he was also a board member of the Owen Sound Gray Bruce YMCA, a generous supporter of their programs. And he welcomed newcomers to the neighborhood. And you can imagine that he's in a good position to do this as a business owner, a family man, but as somebody that moved there from far away himself. Right. So he could share in his experiences and help them out to get better acquainted with the community. And again, this, this individual is doing things in his community in a positive way and doing many things that you don't have to do as a business owner. He didn't have to feed the homeless. He didn't have to have special events to try to raise money. He, he could have just went to work and kept his head down and took all the funds and made his pockets bigger. But that's not what kind of person he was. And, you know, it's January. A lot of people were looking for a new gym or for, for a gym membership somewhere, checking out their their local places to work out. As said, he was board member at the uh, YMCA there, but he had also set up and was running, helping to run a small cafe in the lobby of the YMCA's facility. So anybody that's ever experienced a cafeteria or a cafe or a, a gym that provides maybe a a smoothie or juice bar, yeah, that's that's quite a an amenity to uh, those locations. Yeah, I heard that he served a cafe latte. So Owen Sound, this is a smaller community. It's a charming city located on the southern shore of the Georgian of the Georgian Bay. Known as the Scenic City, it lies at the foot of the Bruce Peninsula, nestled at the mouths of two rivers. So this is a gorgeous area. Think hiking trails, parks, breathtaking waterfalls, and a large, tranquil harbor. The great outdoors is just moments away from the historic downtown. That's where his restaurant is located. This vibrant, historic city has a population of a little more than 21,000 people. So it's, it's not a huge community. According to the 2021 census, as said, just over 21,000 people. Owen Sound's thriving downtown area hosts numerous annual cultural events and festivals. So it's not difficult to see why people continue to flock to this area as there are so many different advantages that would appeal to a wide range of people. Now, some have said, and we see this all over the map, Captain, with all these cases that we discuss, with increased population and growth, sometimes come big city issues and problems. Like many communities across the U.S. and in Canada, the city was dealing with destitution and homelessness, the affordability of available housing, and the effects of the drug epidemic. Crime appeared to be steadily increasing in 2023 in Owen Sound. Some of these would be violent crimes. So to give an example of the crime trends in this city. Right. From 2016 to 2022, there was only one single homicide reported in this community. One. Now fast forward to last year, 2023. We have two murders in July of 2023, and then a little more than a month later, a third life would be claimed, and that, unfortunately, was the murder of our respected businessman, Sharif Rahman. Now, let's get into the day in question here. This will be just last summer, on Thursday, August 17th, 2023. And we are at the Couples Restaurant, the popular downtown establishment, The Curry House. So make mental note of that. It's a Thursday. It's business as usual here for the most part. We have all had the Thursday restaurant experience. It tends to be a little busier than earlier in the week, but not as busy as Friday and Saturday as those are typically your money-making days. It's close to closing time. 
This puts us roughly at about 9 to 9.15 p.m. Sharif Rahman is preparing to close the curry house for the night. So he is circling amongst the tables, exchanging pleasantries with the patrons. But this is also the time in the evening when you are cheerfully bringing up, hey, would you like some dessert or maybe one last drink before I bring you the check? Then after the front of the house, and in this case Sharif, will go around requesting that the patrons settle their bill if they hadn't already done so. Sharif goes over to a table where we have three guys sitting at this table. The three male patrons had been dining that evening, and Sharif asked them to settle their bill. The men apparently refused to pay their tab without explanation, and they get up from their chairs and from the table, and they walk away, and they leave the restaurant. Well, Sharif followed them outside in an attempt to continue the discussion. Hey, we still got this check that needs to be taken care of here, gentlemen. Yeah, they're essentially stealing from his business. Joining him, following him, is his nephew, Adnan. So now we have a group of five men, and what ends up being kind of, they're kind of standing in a circle on the sidewalk just outside of the restaurant. Three of them are customers who reportedly are not planning to pay the bill, refusing, in fact. Thieves. And two gentlemen from the Curry House restaurant. In front of the Curry House, a heated argument quickly escalated into a physical confrontation, resulting in Sharif and his nephew being assaulted by the three men. The Toronto Sun reported that 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 the altercation, which had begun over the dispute concerning a, get ready for this, people, $40 check, yeah. occurred at around 9.15 that evening. And we're pretty... Just pathetic. We're pretty locked and loaded on that time, right? It, it is around 9.15, but that's a pretty solid time, and we know this based off of some evidence and things that we will get into here in a bit. Right. Adnan. Sharif's nephew suffered only minor cuts and bruises from this attack, but Sharif was violently assaulted and beaten about the head to the point of losing consciousness. At the local level, we have the Owen sound police service. They will be some of the first responders to hit the scene when the Owen sound police service OSPS going forward, when they arrive on the scene, It was clear that Sharif had suffered some very serious injuries in the attack outside of his his restaurant. His nephew Adnan was in much better shape, as we said. He's not seriously hurt, but Sharif had been viciously beaten about the head until he was left in a state of unconsciousness. So he's unresponsive when first responders hit the scene. Sharif had been ferociously assaulted, sustaining serious injuries, It was quickly determined that Sharif was critically injured by the three attackers, and so he's rushed to a London, Ontario hospital where he was placed on life support soon after arrival. Let's just reiterate the fact that this is over a $40 bill that these three individuals attacked one man so violently that he goes into a coma and then has to be placed in intensive care over a $40 bill. Well, and the thing that I have a hard time getting over here, Captain, I've never been to Owen Sound. I looked up plenty of pictures and studied the maps of the area. This is not, this is like an upscale area. This is a beautiful area. And I know that that doesn't mean much. Yeah, but much. upscale I, people can also be trash. No, I, I know that, I know that, Crazy can happen anywhere. Unfortunately, violence can happen happen anywhere, and even in our safest of neighborhoods. But it it does make it a little harder to fathom. It makes that pill even harder to swallow when you find that this is something. We have two situations here that make it a tough pill to swallow. One, such a great guy that he seems to be highly unlikely to be the victim of a violent attack and two, such a great area 
that you would think that right. something like this wouldn't happen. And the reason why I'm focusing in on the area a little bit here is that this case to me seems to be the attack seems a little random, but maybe not completely random. And I know that sounds weird to say, but I think we can get into why both could be true here later when we get to some of the theories here in this case. Right. So sadly, Sharif would never recover from the attack and he passed away one week after he was beaten outside of his own restaurant. He was just 44 years old, a pillar of his community and leaving behind a wife and a young child. And I've seen pictures of Sharif's family from some of the vigils and memorials held for this man after he passed. And it was very difficult for me not to tear up seeing his, his daughter's face, such a cute daughter, such a wonderful young family and a man and a, and his wife that are not just building their family. They really laid down some roots here in Owen sound. Well, I know so many true crime shows and podcasts that say this individual lit up a room. I don't think that's what kind of man he was. I think he was one of those guys that he, he didn't have to light up the room. He's, he took a back seat and helped support other people to light up that room. And all the evidence you need to know about how great of an individual this guy was and his community to his friends and family was when it was reported he was attacked, hundreds and hundreds of people showed up to the restaurant to for to show their support. Sometimes we have these events where people show up once a death has occurred, but people were showing up before he died. Yeah, they they estimated that in on one day in particular, probably about 6% of the population of the city. Like that that's a good turnout. Now, to the to the unfortunate kind of colder more business side of these true crime stories. Sharif's passing. This of course elevates the case for the investigators, right? We're going to go from an obvious attack and assault to now a fatal attack. Yeah. So a week after the attack on the same day that Sharif passed away, Owen sound police released information about the violent attack on the businessman. This is, including security camera photos and descriptions of two Caucasian males suspects seen fleeing south on 2nd Avenue East and then east on 9th Street East. Yeah. Sadly, and we'll post these photos on our social media, but it's just the back of these individuals. Yeah, they provided details of a third suspect as well, also described as Caucasian, and a photo of a gray or possibly blue 2000s model, similar to a Ford Escape or Mazda Tribute. So to be clear here, they're not saying it's a Ford Escape that they're looking for. They're not saying it's a Mazda Tribute that they're looking for. They're saying that the description they have from what they can see, the investigators are saying it is similar to a Ford escape or a Mazda tribute. Yeah. And my frustration with this case so far is, and we'll post a picture of the vehicle as well is we have at least two individuals photographed. Yes. It's the back of the individuals, but we have a pretty good description of this car why hasn't anybody come forward and said, I believe it's this individual or I know that these three individuals were going to the Curry house that that night? Well, and police are saying, to be clear here, Captain, police are saying that we believe this vehicle is linked to this incident. Now, the photos were a little grainy, but they're not bad. Uh, they show two of the men only from the back, as the captain pointed out. But a full description, including the clothing that they were wearing, was included in this announcement from the police to the public. All right. So, all right, I'm requesting that everyone now reduce the power levels to their senses, other functions, 
and the white brain matter and redirect that energy and power surplus to your earballs in the giant gray matter in between the earballs. Just get to it. That's the garage way of saying pay attention. Long way of saying Okay, that. so the vehicle sought, linked to the attack, described as a gray or blue 2000s model similar to a Ford Escape or Mazda Tribute. We have three suspects that we are looking for. These are the three men that were sitting at the table that refused to pay their bill that attacked Sharif and his nephew outside of the Curry House restaurant in August of 2023. The first suspect is described as a white man, five foot ten inches tall to six foot two inches tall, with a medium build and short dark hair. Surveillance footage showed him wearing a blue t-shirt, black shorts, and black running shoes. And apparently he's wearing the right kind of shoes because in the image we have captured by that surveillance camera, he is running. He is fleeing the scene. Suspect number two is described as a white male, five foot ten inches to six foot two inches, with a medium build, with short brown hair that is, or more importantly, was in August of 2023, longer on top. He was wearing an orange t-shirt, black shorts, and black running shoes. Police are saying that both suspect number one and suspect number two are believed to be in their mid-20s to mid-30s. There is an image of this suspect as well. So suspect number one and number two, both images are of the men from the back running, fleeing from the scene. So these have been circulating around the web now since one week after the attack. Suspect number three. Unfortunately, we do not have an image of this POS. But what we do have is a general description with what seems likely to be one major difference between our suspects. Suspect number three is, again, Caucasian male. He has curly hair, wearing shorts and a T-shirt. But police believe that this suspect is in his late 40s to mid 50s. Police have released information and images of all three male suspects. And again, two of which they said ran southbound on 2nd Avenue East toward the intersection of 9th Street and continued eastbound on 9th Street East following the attack. And it makes you wonder if this is possibly the father, the third suspect being the father of these two younger individuals. But what I can guarantee you is we're going to plaster these cowards' pictures all over the internet, and we're going to plaster these cowards and these pieces of shit vehicle all over the internet, and somebody will identify these horrible individuals. Who doesn't love the good things in life? Even though one can enjoy a little luxury, it doesn't mean they can always afford it. And that's why there's Quince. Quince is your go-to for luxury essentials at affordable prices. Quince offers a range of high-quality items at prices within reach, like 100% Mongolian cashmere sweaters from $50, washable silk tops and dresses, organic cotton sweaters, and 14-karat gold jewelry. The best part, all Quince items are priced 50 to 80% less than similar brands. By partnering directly with top factories, Quince cuts out the cost of the middleman and passes the savings on to you. And Quince only works with factories that use safe, ethical, and responsible manufacturing practices and premium fabrics and finishes. Don't you love that? Yes, I do. And I also love shopping with Quince online. It's easy. I used our code garage and I got the free shipping. I picked up some of those t-shirts for me that look so good untucked and they're really hard to find. But I also got a couple of gifts, Mongolian cashmere sweaters from only $50. I was super impressed by the quality and the softness of these beautiful cashmere sweaters. And for only $50, I couldn't find that anywhere else. 
Give yourself the luxury you deserve with Quince. Go to quince.com slash garage for free shipping on your order and 365 day returns. That's Q-U-I-N-C-E dot com slash garage to get free shipping and 365 day returns. Quince.com slash garage. If you've been wanting to learn a new language so you can connect with a partner's family, who doesn't speak English, or you just want to watch a foreign film without subtitles, then Rosetta Stone is for you. Rosetta Stone is the most trusted, time-tested app out there. It will fast-track your language acquisition because lessons are immersive. They're designed to teach you to pick up languages in a natural way. Choose from one of 25 languages. Plus, with Rosetta Stone's True Accent feature, You'll get feedback on how well you're pronouncing words. Rosetta Stone is convenient. It can be used on a desktop or as an app, and lessons are as short as 10 minutes. Plus, it's incredible value, especially compared to pricey tutors. Here at The Garage, we love Rosetta Stone. Whether it's Nick trying to learn Spanish or me brushing up on my German, Ich bin Captain. It's the most convenient and affordable and It's the best tool I've ever used to learn a foreign language. Don't put off learning that language. There's no better time than right now to get started. New year, new language. For a very limited time, True Crime Garage listeners can get Rosetta Stone's lifetime membership for 50% off. That's 50% off unlimited access to 25 language courses for the rest of your life. Redeem your 50% off at rosettastone.com slash garage today. That's rosettastone.com slash garage today. This message is sponsored by Greenlight. It seems like every day that you're online, you see a new parenting hack that someone swears by. Some of them are awesome, some awful. But if you're looking to raise kids that are financially responsible, I have a lifesaver recommendation you need to check out. Greenlight. Greenlight is a debit card and money app made for families. It gives kids and teens an easy and fun way to gain financial literacy while giving parents peace of mind. You can send instant money transfers, automate allowance, and keep an eye on kids' spending with real-time notifications. Meanwhile, your kids can begin their journey towards financial autonomy by learning how to save, invest, and spend wisely. The app also comes with games that teach kids money skills in a fun, memorable way. The app includes a chores feature where you can set up reoccurring or one-time chores, customized to your family's needs, and reward kids for a job well done. I love Greenlight, and I know several of my friends who are using this app and debit card to teach their kids setting goals, achieving goals, and look, if they want to get that new electronic device or that new video game, here is a way daughter or son that you can earn it on your own. Hard work is still a really good thing. And my friends are using this with their kids. The ages range from elementary school all the way up to kids that are in college. It works for all of them. It's great. Sign up for Greenlight today and get your first month free when you go to greenlight.com slash garage. That's greenlight.com slash garage to try Greenlight for free greenlight.com slash garage. All right, we are back. Cheers, mates. A quick announcement. We'll be at CrimeCon in Nashville at the end of May, Mm -hmm. and we'll be at CrimeCon UK in the middle of September. Our promo code is TCG for 10% off. We would love to hang out with you and have a have a nice pint of beer and a nice conversation about true crime. We're, we're packing things up, taking the garage party to Nashville and taking the garage party over to London, England. We hope to see every one of you out there. That would be fantastic. Now, Captain, you hit on something right before the break. These guys are pieces of shit. Well, I no, I like that you were saying that what if the older suspect is the father of the two younger suspects or the father of possibly one 
right. of the other suspect. So let's think about that for a minute and hone in on it. If police police are telling us, based off of the, the witnesses that we talked to, based off of the people at the restaurants, and based off of the images that we collected from surveillance footage in the area, this, this is likely other businesses in the area or maybe even traffic cameras. But they are saying, we believe that suspects one and two are likely in their mid twenties to mid thirties. And we also believe that suspect number three, the one that we do not have a picture or image of to circulate, he's dressed very similarly. He shared a a sit down meal with the other two. He's involved in this altercation and fleeing the scene. We believe that this suspect suspect number three is in his late forties to mid fifties. So if police have this information right if their suspicions are correct well then that puts a possible age difference between suspects one and two compared to suspects suspect number three at a range of as little as about five years difference to possibly up to 30 years difference in age right so that's quite the window there and i think that does open up the possibility for if, if there is a 15, 20, 25, 30 year gap in age between the suspects one and two and suspect three, you go further down that line and you get different possibilities. Is this a, is this a boss? Is this an uncle? Is it a penis head? Or is, if it's a five year difference, is it an older brother? Uh, maybe just an older friend, but then the possibility of, is this a father of one of the other suspects? And the reason why I hone in on that, and I'm so glad you did as well, is that is we already stated the police. This was a very public attack. It happened downtown out on the street. Cowards. After dark, but where anybody could see the attack, anybody could see the men fleeing from the scene and police very rightfully. So they very quickly make this a very public investigation. Hey, public, we need your help to identify these horrible people. And I I think honing in on that idea, three men having a dinner on a Thursday evening, that happens all the time. But you really shrink your percentages if now you got the public thinking, oh, a father and son, grown father and son having dinner with uh, with a friend. Or grown father and sons having a dinner on a Thursday in Owen Sound in August. That can really shrink the percentages of our suspect pool. It also makes you wonder, because this is such a small, knit community, does somebody know something and they're just not coming forward? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I feel what... You know me, Captain... I'm a betting man. I would wager a Franklin. Somebody out there knows. One of these three has told somebody else something, or somebody out there knows one or two of these men were at the Curry House that night. I yeah. I feel extremely confident about that. So shame on you if you've not come forward. Well, no, and if you haven't come forward, guess what you are? You're lump, a piece of shit. Yeah, lump them in with the batch. You might as well have been there at the attack. So police didn't stop there when they were seeking information from the public because several days after the release of the vehicle information and the suspect descriptions, Owen Sound Police, they're they're also aided by the Gray Bruce OPP. So we got multiple agencies involved very early on. They announced that they were also seeking witnesses from the night of Sharif's murder, particularly those having video footage between 8 p.m. and 9.45 p.m. So why is that important? You can see on the surveillance footage, uh, the image of the vehicle in particular, it is time-stamped. And yes, we've talked about that those time-stamps can be off. Right. But it is time-stamped, I believe, 9.28 or 9.29 p.m. that night. And we have witnesses at the restaurant saying that this altercation took place between 9 and 9.15 yeah, this and, looks like it says on this time, on this time stamp, nine twenty one. Perfect. 
So they have just enough time to flee. Who knows if all three of them fled to the vehicle and then took off in the vehicle or if only the older suspect did. That part gets a little murky because they're trying to figure out, let's create a trail of these guys and see how far we can follow that trail to lead to who they are. We have the a member of parliament here, MP Alex Roth, who he was publicly urging the suspects to surrender. He's promising, look, you you will be caught. There's no question about that in his mind. Yeah. You will be caught even if you don't come forward. You have the opportunity here now to come forward, do the right thing. But let's go back to what their other request was. We're requesting, do you know these guys or do you know this vehicle? But now we're saying, hey, we're looking for additional witnesses. We're looking for people that may have video or have snapped a picture on their phone between 8 p.m. and 9.45 p.m. If you are from Owen Sound, if you live there or were visiting there in August of 2023, on this particular night between 8 and 9.45, as the police are requesting... You, do, I want to speak directly to you, if I may, for a minute. You do not have to believe that you saw anything of importance. You should still contact the police and tell them your experience that night. Well, and to be clear, there's two photos that are circulating on the Internet. One, the car is more a, a side view. The other view of the car is more of at an angle you can almost see the license plate i know that the photo is grainy but law enforcement and and pretty much anybody out there with a computer has the technology to try to clean up that in image and possibly get some kind of identifier uh, of of a license plate these, these individuals will be caught and if you don't turn yourself in, you're more of a coward. And, and I hope whatever they get in prison, you got you got that coming to you, buddy. Well, and the captain's exactly right. There's two images circulating with the vehicle in regards to the vehicle. There are also two images circulating regarding the suspects number one and number two. So you get an image of suspect number one of the back of him fleeing the scene. Right. And then the second photo, you get an image of suspect number two from the back of him fleeing the scene. If you look closely in the image of suspect number one, you can actually see suspect number two fleeing in a slightly different direction right. in that same image. So the reason why I bring that up here, Captain, is to circle back to what police are requesting. If you have any video from that night or you took any pictures yourself in Owen Sound that night, you don't have to believe that you saw the suspects. Just send those in. Let them let the police take a look at that. Maybe they pick up on something in the background. Right. Maybe they see that that vehicle elsewhere in the background of your video or the background of your picture and they're able to pick up some other detail about that vehicle that makes it e more easily identifiable to police. And I bet these scumbags are hiding that vehicle right now because they know everybody's looking for it and they might not be able to get rid of it. So they're, they're probably hiding it somewhere. I do want to read a portion of this letter from the Owen sound MP Alex rough, the one that was urging the suspects to turn themselves in. So, the part of the letter that I like. Yeah, because he's probably going to do a better job than me by going, yeah, you guys are cowards. Three on one attack over a $40 bill. You're, you're probably privileged scum. Well, and you talked about the community coming together, and that's the part that I'll start off with in his letter. Uh, from Alex Ruff, he says, the greater community has come together in support of the Raman family in a tremendous show of solidarity, but Canada and all of us can do more. There has been much speculation on the motives of the three men involved in the assault on August 17th, including whether they are locals to our region or possibly visitors. It doesn't matter. The terrible fact is that Sharif is no longer with us and our community has lost a valued member. 
I write this letter as a plea to those responsible. Do the right thing. Turn yourselves into police. Personally, I am confident in our law enforcement agencies, and you will be caught and held responsible. However, you have the opportunity to do the right thing and accept the consequences of your actions. So again, police looking for these three men, looking for the vehicle, looking for additional witnesses, videos, and pictures from that night. Let's get into some of the theories. Yeah. So one of the major theories out there, Captain, is that this crime was the outcome of a dine and dash, some kind of dine and dash attempt, possibly spurred by the current increase in crime, drug addiction, and homelessness in the area of late. The two images I see, I don't think I'm seeing a homeless, I don't think I'm seeing homeless people. No. Um, I think the difficult thing is that Sharif was such a caring person and so so open and uh, kind to his fellow man. Had a homeless person walked in to get a meal, he would have welcomed that individual. I, I feel confident saying that. And here's the other thing, man. Like, So the attack was a dispute over the bill then, if this would to be a dine and dash situation. Right. And we know that the the dispute occurred after they left refusing to the pay the bill. So that part's not in question. And reportedly, the bill only totaled $40. But the other issue, though, too, is nobody that was working that night is telling us that these individuals said, hey, we weren't happy with our meal. It, it almost seems as if we don't know why they were refusing to pay can i i I, i'd like to address something that i think is a bit of a misstep here in this investigation so far yeah stop asking for permission it's your show captain you don't let me do anything around yeah you you (laughs) will speak when i allow you to speak and i know this seems like such a silly detail but as a former bartender and uh server front of the house guy i loved working in restaurants you're very good at it. You know, we have to go back to it one day. Worked in property management for many years, but I will say this: I I enjoyed working at restaurants so much that there there are days I wake up and I miss it. And there there's days where I'm like, you know, I should get a part time job bartending just because I enjoyed it so much. You should. The thing here is though, I think one one thing that could be helpful. I shouldn't say a misstep. I think investigators are doing a great job with this case. I think one thing that could be helpful is can you tell us what was on their check that night? I know that sounds silly, I but it could trigger something for somebody out there listening or watching the news or reading this in the newspaper. Because to me, it seems more like a drink bill than a food bill. Three grown men, two of them described as five foot 10 to six foot two inches tall. Yeah. That's my wheelhouse. That's that's I fit that description. I rack up a $40 bill by myself if I'm sitting down to dinner. Right. So, yeah, this seems to me like, hey, let's grab a, a couple coffees and and maybe split an appetizer or something. Let's grab a couple beers. I did look up their menu, the Curry House menu. The beverages aren't listed on there. I was trying to get a, an idea if they serve alcohol or not. Right. And the reason why I bring that up is that typically my experience is that a lot of people – when it comes to alcohol and things like cigarettes or cigars, most people tend to find something that they like and they have kind of their regular, oh, that's kind of my usual drink, right? And so I throw that out there that putting out what is on the bill could trigger somebody out there when you're begging the public over and over again for help, give us more information, help us to help you. If somebody out there goes, eh, you know, my husband would never do that, would never be a part of that. But wait a second, him and him and my son, they were in Owen Sound that night. Yeah. But they don't like Indian food. They wouldn't go to the curry house. Oh, he ordered a gin and tonic. They ordered two. I don't know if they still serve this moosehead beers. That used to be a popular Canadian beer. But, you know, you get what I'm throwing down here, Captain. There, There are a lot of people that I have buddies that a couple buddies. One in particular drinks Miller Lite. That's it. That's all. Like, 
The only way he drinks another beer is if there is no Miller Lite at all. Yeah, and so if you have seen a picture of one of these suspects and you go, well, that kind of looks like my buddy and he only drinks Miller Lite and Miller Lite's on the bill, you're more likely to come forward and tell law enforcement, hey, that possibly could be my buddy. But also, when you got three individuals, that attack didn't happen in thirds. One of these three individuals was probably the aggressor. We probably know some of this information from the nephew being a surviving victim. And there might have been one of these three that didn't really attack anybody at all. And hopefully that person has a brain and will come forward. Because if you don't come forward, they're just going to lump everybody together and you're all going to get charged with the same thing. Well, And here's why I think that one of the three may have told somebody something along the way. And, th- and, right. and if they did, if this did occur, then somebody knows for certain who at least one of the perpetrators because think about this Sharif unfortunately he's sent to the hospital doesn't regain consciousness so he can't describe the attackers or give some additional information if he had it but he lingered he didn't die instantly he didn't die there at the scene it's very likely that one or all three of these individuals woke up the next morning not even knowing that they sent the guy to the hospital they may not know that Waking up the next day, they're at lunch. One of them's at lunch. One of them's talking to a buddy. Somebody's talking to a coworker and says, yeah, man, strangest thing last night was out with a couple buddies and, uh, got into it with these restaurant workers. We had beat the one dude up pretty bad and left him on the side of the street and got the hell out of there. Right. That, I feel like that happened. I feel like somebody told that exact story. And I go back to the, let's see what was on the check because I can, I know of at least two cases, two real life cases that they honed in on a suspect based off of what kind of cigarettes they smoked. I know of one serial killer that they narrowed it down to him based off of what carry out he went to that he frequented. So these things are potentially things that could help the public, help the public to help the police. The other thing, too, given the images that they captured, you're right, Captain. You hone in on and trying to find some details, some identifiers on that vehicle. That's smart. The thing to me, when I see the backs of these two suspects, pieces of shit, they appear to be dressed rather casual, right? Like, I don't even see like, like coming gym. from the gym. Exactly. It look it looks like they, they were what someone would wear at the gym. This is not like a polo shirt and some khaki shorts or i don't even know nice shorts <laughs> yeah. I, I, I wear Cardio, jeans all the time Cardio i don't know shorts. nice shorts but you know what i mean there's some nicer shorts and then there's these look like you, you might want to go out and pick play a game of pickup basketball no and the other thing too is if you work with somebody or friends with somebody that has a black eye had some cuts on their face or maybe some marks on their arm and and they told you some dumb bullshit story call law enforcement let law enforcement figure it out like you said there's probably a lot of people that don't know that they have important information and look for all we know law enforcement has that important information and they're just building a case before they make this arrest because like we said this is a small tight community and these these people could be quote unquote pillars of the community well they might have been pillars at one point but now they're pieces of shit of the community and they need to be in jail the other thing when we talk about identifiers if possible if you're only able to clean up one part of the picture on our suspects i would hone in on the shoes right because those shoes are going to be much more descriptive than the shirt and the shorts. That would be, I would love to, I I stared at those shoes long and hard. And I tell you that I, to the point where I was starting to see stuff that wasn't even there. But if you, if there's one part that you could enhance and clean up on those photos, 
I want to know more about those shoes because unfortunately we cannot see the suspect's faces. Another theory in this case, and it might be an obvious one, is that the attack was an anti-Muslim hate crime, particularly since it was perpetrated by, as described, three Caucasian males. And this is has been discussed quite a bit in this case. In fact, some sources reported the crime as being potentially racially motivated. However, it is important to note that both of the two investigating agencies, the OSPS and the OPP, yeah, you know have not confirmed motive behind the assault. So the two investigating agencies, they're not saying that they believe that it was Dine and Dash. Right. Motivated. They're not saying that it was r- racially motivated. They're not saying that it was a hate crime. But of those three, of those the two theories that we've discussed here, the dine and dash thing is is you cannot deny that. That is a fact. These guys left the restaurant with no intention to pay the bill. So that is involved in the situation, but we don't know if it's uh, if you can underline it and circle it as a motivating factor, the investigating agencies have stressed that the investigation is ongoing and to date, they have not uncovered any evidence pointing to racism as a driver of the senseless act of violence. Further Muslim community leaders do not seem to believe it was a biased crime. Although some of Sharif's family and friends would certainly disagree including family friend and advocate Mark yeah, Barbosa. Race was a factor. Barbosa is confident his peaceful friend would never have instigated this type of altercation. And he says his friend was likely cornered by thugs who he believes were looking for trouble. Despite the recent killings of Muslim families in nearby London, Ontario, and Ottawa, The Owen Sound Muslim Community Association rejected the idea that Sharif's death was the result of racial bias. They shared with the media that in general, the community of Owen Sound was welcoming a welcoming place for minorities. Now, it's difficult to believe that the police were not able to obtain better images of the three assailants. Right. Given that the downtown area has numerous security cameras. It's surprising that the few photos of these men that were taken were of poor quality and only features two of the men instead of three and only features two of them as they fled the scene from the back. But again, this is what we are being told by law enforcement. They might have a couple aces up their sleeves. Well, I hope that they do. And if they do, and it's stuff that could help the public lead them to the suspects, don't hold on to that stuff forever, man. Get that stuff out there now. Let's let's get these guys today, not tomorrow. Yeah. Here's the thing, though. To me, I believe that it seems unlikely that the men were local. And I say that considering that it's been all of these months since the crime And apparently no one has recognized the perpetrators. So think about that for a minute. That also would shrink the suspect pool. If we're looking to trigger somebody out there listening or trigger somebody out there watching the news or reading a newspaper to help us find one or all three of these guys. Do you know somebody that was visiting that area that week? We just, we described the area to you. What is there that is not everywhere? Water. Large natural water sources. Could these guys have been on a fishing trip? A golf trip? Visiting the area with friends? Not traveling with a wife or kids or family? There's If they're not local, that shrinks the suspect pool. Somebody out there should know something. The other thing, too, is if they're not local, how far away... And where did they come from? Right. Now, circling back to the hate crime situation, sadly, and unfortunately, hate crimes are not foreign to that part of Canada 
as of late. As we said, there were some hate crimes in London, Ontario. A Caucasian male who identified or identifies as a white nationalist was recently found guilty on four counts of first degree murder and one count of attempted murder. He was deemed responsible for a June 2021 vehicular attack that resulted in the deaths of four members of a Pakistani Muslim family, along with gravely injuring a nine-year-old boy. And just a few months ago in Ottawa, a shooting rampage at a September wedding resulted in the deaths of two Muslims and wounding of six others. After this incident, police issued a statement that there was no indication that the attack was motivated by hate. So what we're saying is this is, this remains a possibility, even though police aren't honing in on it. The other thing though, that you need to keep in mind is unless they had been to this restaurant before, unless they knew of the owner, then the hate crime situation seems a little difficult Right. Because to me, on the surface, it almost feels like this. Oh, this is just kind of random. It's a circumstantial case. They go there. They decide not to pay the bill. They think they can just walk out and it turns into an argument and then a fight. That's a little random. Well, no. And and I don't want to downplay the situation, but I think it's just self entitled. They went there. They didn't like something for whatever reason. They didn't want to give explanation because. We're, we're self-entitled, and we don't need to tell you why we're not paying. We're just not going to pay. Alter- altercation takes place. I think it got out of hand. And like you said, they probably told individuals, oh, we got in this uh, fight with this restaurant owner and probably didn't even know how badly he was injured. And now you have a death on your hands, and now you have maybe three individuals that would never do something like this ever. And it just got out of hand or because they were drinking, it got out of hand or maybe because they're just self-entitled pieces of shit that it got out of hand. Well, and here's where it becomes not so random. Okay. If these three guys are sitting at the restaurant and they go, you know what? I don't think I like these people. I'm out of here. Yeah. I'm not, you know what? I'm not going to pay the bill. Well, then now it's not so random. Right, and also right. you could you can see how it could quickly escalate into a hate crime. Right, well, I'm not going to pay the bill, and if they try to do anything about it, I'll mess them up. Yeah, take them out. So you can have a little bit of both, and we've discussed this a hundred times on the show. Almost all of these murders are some form of a hate crime. Yes, we have a very distinctive definition of a hate crime in different jurisdictions and in this country. I don't know what it is in Canada, but to murder someone, you have to hate them. That's that, that's how it goes, or at least hate them in that moment. Right. Now, the thing that I do want to point out here, though, too, is what, ma- again, what makes this even more tragic. I don't even care that the bill was only $40. If the bill would have been $250. It wouldn't matter. Sharif Rahman. He strikes me as the kind of individual, what was his, one of his major goals of his adult life to feed his community, not just because he was a restaurant owner to feed his community through charitable efforts. This is the kind of guy that if you say, I can't pay the bill, didn't like the service or times have been tough. Whether it was a $40 bill, $150 bill, $300 bill, Sharif Rahman was probably the kind of dude that would be like, you know what? I get it. Times are tough. Why, just How about uh, tell your friends that the restaurant's great, leave me an awesome review, and we'll, we'll just we'll call it even. You know, this. I'm trying to point out that th- there are a million reasons why this didn't have to happen. But these three chose to do this. And even if you love one of these three people or all three of them and you know who it is, you got to turn them in. There's a million reasons why this didn't have to happen. These three chose to do this and treat this guy this way and beat him down to the point of unconsciousness and death in the street in front of his restaurant. Well, no, and, and to be clear, no matter what actions 
or what kind of life these three individuals were living before this moment, these actions make them murderers. Murderers. Cause and effect. They need to be punished for their actions. Somebody knows more. Somebody probably has been going on the internet every day looking into information. They know who did it. You need to come forward. You're probably listening right now. Heck, one of these individuals might be listening right now. We should point out, too, that while we talk about the crime trends and the the violent crimes increasing in 2023 in Owen Sound with the murders of three individuals when they only had one murder in the five, six years prior, the two murders that took place before Sharif Rahman was attacked in front of his restaurant in both situations, they quickly found the perpetrators. They made arrests. So those are th- this is not connected to those other cases. Right. It's impossible for them to be connected to those other face those other cases. Now, the other reason why I suspect that maybe these guys aren't incredibly local here, and, and I hope and I look, I believe this is a great investigation, but this is certainly a possibility that they're not local. I hope that they track down. I hope that they were on it for rental cars that match this description at this time period. I hope they're on that and checked every place that they could possibly think of. Also, extend that. It doesn't have to be a rental that somebody picked up in town. It could be somebody picked up a rental out of town and drove it into town. So I hope that they're checking those potential leads. And then the other thing, too, is... The other reason why I think that maybe it's not local is the 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 public, the community outpouring for support for this family and for justice. And look, these people, they want their streets to be cleaned up. Nobody wants this to happen in their community, especially to a beloved individual, generous individual in their community. And so the people that came out to the vigils, to the memorial services, and that, that put flowers in front of the restaurant and continue to put up signs and flyers asking for help it gets very hard to hide in that situation if you are local well they also did a gofundme account i think they wanted to raise about twenty five thousand dollars for his family and i i believe that it's well over a quarter million that's that's how much this guy was loved in his community right and i hope and pray that this is not happening i hope and pray that the person that knows something out there is going, well, yeah, it's unfortunate this guy died. They didn't intend to kill him, and his family did receive $250,000. Don't rationalize any of this away. Go and look at the picture. Look at the face of Sharif Robbins' daughter, and then do the right thing. Anybody that has information in this case, again, if you have photos from that area, from that night on your phone, if you have video, and even if you don't think that you saw anything of importance, send that information to law enforcement. Let them see what they, what they can find in those images. I encourage everybody out there with information to reach out to the main investigating agency, which is Owen Sound Police Service. So people with further information or pictures or videos are asked to contact Owen Sound Police at 519-376-1234 or Detective Constable Jeff Bridgman at gbridgman at owensoundpolice.com. And that information will be in this week's show notes. I get emails all the time of how can you help. Here's a case that you can help. Take these pictures of the suspects and the vehicle and plaster it all over social media. I want to thank everybody for joining us here each and every week in the garage. Make sure you subscribe to the show colonel do we have any recommended reading yes we do captain we are going to the great country of canada for this week's recommended reading and a shout out to our friend 
Jordan from the Nighttime Podcast. He is leading the charge in keeping Canada weird. And we have to apologize to Jordan because I think... Because he's weird? We lied to his face, right? Oh, to yeah. the face. To his face. Uh, back in 2016, mm. when we were just podcasting toddlers. Yeah, we little lads. Jordan was nice enough to send me this book. It's Murder at McDonald's, The Killer's Next Door. And this is about a gruesome crime. Three young men from Sydney, Nova Scotia. They went to school, made friends, and had some fun. They got a bit older, worked at a couple of casual jobs, hung out in bars and pool halls. Then, in May of 1992, they walked into the McDonald's restaurant in Sydney River, planning to rob the place. And in the dark hours of pre-dawn, these three seemingly ordinary young men brutally murdered three McDonald's employees and left a fourth for dead. This was a book that Jordan was nice enough to send to us. And I say that we lied right to his face because I think we told him in 2016 that we would send him a t-shirt, a True Crime Garage t-shirt. I believe he's still waiting for that shirt. So it's only a lie if we, if you know, we still have years, I think, to yeah. fulfill that uh and honor that that to uh, Mr. Jordan. But shout out to Jordan up in Canada and the Nighttime Pod. And check out Murder at McDonald's, The Killer's Next Door. It's a fascinating case and told very well by the journalists that covered it. You can find that recommendation and many, many more on our website's recommended page, truecrimegarage.com. And until next week, be good, be kind, and don't let them.